Woody Woodpecker is the zany, erratic and violent star creation of Walter Lance, an animator with very little drive for innovation who found his way in the golden age of animation almost by way of default. Initially debuting as a one-off character in Lance's Andy Panda series, Woody quickly became his most popular character ever, eclipsing the fame of Andy in a matter of years and eventually starring in 200 classic shorts. Through a series of studio setbacks and budgetary problems, Lance survived as the final American animator producing cartoons for theatrical release, and Woody the final leading character starring in them, outliving the likes of Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny. Despite this, Woody struggled through a rapidly watered down climate, eventually becoming a shell of the character he once was. In 2020, Woody Woodpecker turns 80 years old, and to celebrate I will trace his entire evolution from 1940 to now. To do so, we will look at the character's history and the changes in his design, personality and stylistic approach prevalent over eight decades of shorts, television series and feature films. In this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> In the earliest days of animation, visionary filmmakers changed the landscape of the art form. Such pioneers as Winsor McKay, John Randolph Bray, The Flasher Brothers and Walt Disney took on an innovate or die mentality, making great strides to change the way stories were told and characters were established, revolutionising the technology that made it all possible along the way. Caught up amongst the crowd was Walter Lance, a young animator who came to prominence in the 1940s thanks to a number of famous creations. However, Lance couldn't exactly be seen amongst the echelon of pioneers who he had either worked for, with or against. Despite having produced a number of notable works, it's perhaps fair to say that Lance came into prominence a little too late to be known as a pioneer, or that he never had the drive or desire to be one. Instead, Lance, working at some of the most prolific studios on some of the most popular cartoons, found a market created by those around him and found a way to survive comfortably within it, really pushing himself or his artists to greatness. He would wait for other studios to innovate and take advantage of the fruits of their labours. In fact, in later years, Lance referred to his artists as people who didn't want to work for Disney anymore, essentially seasoned professionals who'd already established their mark on the industry. Animation historian Leonard Moulton referred to Lance as an ambitious young man who knew how to get ahead in the early days of animation when others were disorganised or ineffectual as businessmen. He had begun his career in animation at only 16 in New York in 1916 as a cameraman for the Hearst International Film Service, working his way up to animator in the space of two years, working on such series as Crazy Cat, The Cats and Jammer Kids and Jerry on the Job, before later moving to the Bray Bowers studio where he found himself working on Mutt and Jeff. Most significantly, Lance found himself working for John Bray around 1920, first as an animator and director on Colonel He's a Liar, and later as studio manager in charge of the studio's entire output, including works of his own creation. Hybrid shorts starring the likes of Dinky Doodle and Pete the Pup, both series of which saw Lance starring alongside the cartoons, were mildly popular. While Lance developed his own techniques for the shorts hybrid animation, they were hardly influential, as the Fleischers had already pioneered the form half a decade earlier with their groundbreaking Out of the Inkwell series, and more recently Walt Disney had further revolutionised them with his popular Alice comedies. Lance's hybrid works were highly derivative of what came before, and likewise his Unnatural History series at Bray also took much from the Terry Tunes Aesop's Fables. When the Bray Studios closed in 1927, Lance made the move to California, where he spent a number of years jumping from job to job, taking what he could get when he could get it. He saw stints at Max Sennett comedies as a pro bono gag writer and even with legendary producer Hal Roach providing gag work and animation on films such as 1928's Flying Elephant starring Laurel and Hardy. Through his Hollywood connections, Lance found himself falling in with a powerful crowd, regularly attending parties and poker games with the who's who of Hollywood, including the owner of Universal Pictures, Carl Lemley. 
Lemley had come to know Lance through his gag work on Universal's live action Andy Gump series and his low level animation work on cartoons featuring Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, recently ransacked from his creators Walt Disney and Up Iwerks by Charles Mintz, a producer creating cartoons on contract for Universal. It's evident that Lance may have spent some time working as a chauffeur for Lemley and other producers, or that perhaps his attendance at these parties was somewhat limited to getting sandwiches. But regardless, Lance Lance knew how to schmooze and soon found himself a confidant of the studio mogul. At this time, as luck would have it, Lemley was growing tired of Mintz, whose slapdash Oswalds were clearly inferior to those produced by Disney, leading to a rapid decline in the character's popularity. Lance found himself in the perfect position to act as an informer, helping to sway Lemley's decision to kick Mintz off the series and open his own cartoon studio on the Universal lot, where shorts could be made in-house and on the cheap. In some uninformed or misinterpreted versions of the story, it's said that Lance won the keys to the studio and the character over a poker bet. However, the truth isn't always as fantastical as it may seem. While Lance may not have risen from lowly staff animator to studio manager in a poker bet, he never partook in the game after all. It's likely he did so at a poker game, during what animation historian David Bossett refers to as quiet negotiations. Although most of Lance's work had been derivative, Lemley obviously saw something in the passionate animator and swayed by his experience managing the Bray studio and producing cartoons on small budgets, announced his his arrival at Universal City as the head of the studio's new cartoon department in April 1929. Essentially, Lance's big lucky break was not an invention, innovation or character of his own, but an inheritance. The Oswald shorts were revitalised and in true Lance style made more in line with those produced by Disney. In fact, later series developed by Lance at Universal such as Technicolor cartoon classics took obvious cues from Disney's Silly Symphonies, just as his later swing symphonies and musical miniatures did. As animation historian Michael Barrier put it, the Lance cartoons reflect Disney's supremacy throughout the late 30s, sometimes mimicking them precisely. Despite producing the first colour sound cartoon, a segment from Universal's 1930 feature The King of Jazz, utilising the two-strip Technicolor process, it was quickly overshadowed by Disney's use of the full-colour three-strip Technicolor process only two years later. Lance plugged away at Universal for seven years, until in 1936 the studio saw a corporate shake-up, resulting in Lemley being ousted from the company. Not one to waste an opportunity, Lance went to the new heads of Universal and proposed the possibility of taking the animation division independent. Instead of working for Universal, he'd open his own studio and sell them the distribution of the cartoons. Universal agreed, even providing funding for him to do so and allowing him to remain on the lot. By 1938, however, Oswald had run out of steam, with Lance finding it hard to keep up with the competition. Not only were Disney continuing to dominate with their roster of animated characters, including Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Goofy, the new kids on the block at the Schlesinger Studios Termite Terrace were breaking new ground, introducing radical screwball characters for Warner Brothers, including Porky Pig, Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny. Hoping to develop a new standout character that would rival them, Lance debuted Andy Panda to moderate success in late 1939. However, Andy's series became best known as the vehicle from which Lance's most famous creation would break through. Or should I say, peck through. Guess who? As with much of Lance's story, the inception of Woody Woodpecker has been told many different times in many contradictory ways, often by Lance himself, whose retelling was constantly romanticised. The most widely recognised version of Woody's inception says that, while staying in a log cabin, Lance and his wife Grace Stafford were constantly terrorised by a woodpecker, pecking holes into the roof each night in an effort to store nuts for the winter. Each night Lance would chase the bird away and hear him let out a little raucous scream or laugh as he flew away. So enraged, Lance calculated one evening to give the bird a scare with his shotgun before Stafford suggested that he instead put his pent up rage into developing a woodpecker character, which at that point had never been done before. 
A popular version of the story places this event at a cabin retreat during Lance and Stafford's honeymoon, though Moulton points out their honeymoon occurred after the character's first appearance. Another version, told by Lance during an episode of The Woody Woodpecker Show in the 1950s, places the event at his own personal cottage in Sherwood Forest, LA. This one is just as dubious, however, as many of these television anecdotes were subject to much hyperbole or exaggeration, for many of them treat Woody as if he were a real living being, with Lance even saying that he chose to use Woody in a series instead of shooting him, inferring that the woodpecker in the cartoons and the woodpecker terrorising his cottage were one and the same. Whether this event ever happened or was a total fabrication isn't quite known, but one more version of the story sounds a little more likely. Lance's team had supposedly devised a story where Andy and his father experienced roof troubles caused by a rainstorm, and according to Lance biographer Joe Adamson, Walter took one look at the storyboard and he said, that's too expensive. Think of something else that's going to get in their way when they're trying to fix their roof. How about a crazy woodpecker? As Moulton notes, Lance was constantly searching for animals that had not been used as cartoon stars before. And I think it's fairly safe to say that simply hoping to expand his roster of characters, Lance just found one that lent himself well to both physical and gag comedy. At that, in some interviews, Lance notes Woody being created specifically for that cartoon, growing organically out of the story. While others see him in food that the character was kicking around the studio for a while until they found the right cartoon to place him in. Inspiration could have come from a real life woodpecker incident, but we'll never know. Whatever the case, Woody Woodpecker first appeared unnamed in 1940 Andy Panda short Knock Knock, directed by Lance with a story by ex Schlesinger animator Ben Bugs Hardaway. Hardaway had introduced Happy Rabbit, the character that would become Bugs Bunny, in 1938 Looney Tunes short Porky's Hair Hunt, and later became his namesake. Hardaway helped Lance develop Woody as an erratic screwball character, in the same vein as those he'd had a hand in developing for the Looney Tunes. Though however derivative Woody may have been of them, a wicked streak was added. While Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck were zany and unpredictable, they were lovable and somewhat innocent. Woody however was made brash and unapologetic, displaying fits of unbridled manic violence never before seen in a Lance cartoon. Where the characters that had preceded him were often cutesy, animator Alex Lovey made Woody, as many historians have called him, garish, grotesque and ugly. He was completely out of proportion, short and stumpy with chubby legs, long arms, huge feet and hands, a receding chin, large pointed beak, spiked back hair and two goofy bucked teeth. He was also multicoloured, with a gaudy juxtaposition of whites, reds, blues, yellows, greens and purples. While inspired by the acorn woodpecker, artists styled him off the palliated woodpecker, much to the continued behest of ornithologists around the world. Lance noted that the the audience laughed so hard in the earlier screenings that he immediately decided to give him his own series. And in 1941, after only one appearance, Woody starred in his first self-titled cartoon. Woody Woodpecker was a hit with audiences. With his blend of zany screwball personality, erratic violence and showy colours, Moulton notes it would have been difficult for him to go unnoticed. Despite Lance noting we didn't start out to make a famous character, he truly became an overnight star, going on to say, it just happened, it just caught on. Animation historian Jerry Beck observes, emerging in the same year as Bugs Bunny and Tom and Jerry, Lance really caught the right character at the right moment. For the remainder of 1941, Woody starred in a further three shorts. That's one more appearance than Andy Panda that same year. In fact, Woody had so quickly run away with the spotlight that after that year's $21 a day, once a month, he wouldn't appear alongside Andy until 1946. With each short, Woody seemed crazier, more irreverent, more violent and more insufferable to the characters around him. Beck attributes several factors to his popularity, saying he's a little bird character living in a tree. He's picked on, he gets even with them, he looks friendly and yet he's not. The earlier shorts even set up a formula that would be heavily utilised over the next few decades. Woody on the quest for food. In the first three shorts to star Woody, he was voiced by the legendary Mel Blanc, who applied a voice he'd developed in high school. You're not going to pull that old gag on me, are you, son? In fact, the voice had a striking similarity to the one he'd been using for Daffy Duck, minus the lisp. That is correct! Absolutely 100% correct! And the crazy, iconic Woody Woodpecker laugh <laughs> 
had been previously heard from Bugs Bunny's predecessor. <laughs> The character was not only styled off Looney Tunes, but sounded like them too. After being signed to an exclusivity contract with Warner Brothers, Blank stepped away from the role, with others such as Danny Webb, Kent Rogers and eventually Hardaway himself all stepping in throughout the decade. Blank's laugh, however, was continuously used as a stock sound effect until the late 1940s. Appearing in six shorts between 1942 and 1943, three per year, Lovey, who took over directorial duties, slowly made him rounder, softer and cuter. The most notable change throughout the Lovey directed shorts saw Woody toned down, given a kinder, gentler disposition. He was made less of a troublemaker and more of a daydreamer. As such, the shorts are considered by Moulton to have no punch. It could be argued that Lovey's refinements were a natural progression, however, considering the personality traits seen in the first shorts truly made the character, this change could come down to Lance's indifference to consistency and polished storytelling, with the raging world war causing a struggle to stay within stringent budgets and deadlines. Early on, the studio didn't even have a story department, just a bulletin board where ideas were pinned and pumped out with little development. But perhaps this added to the erratic charm of the early shorts. Lovey, however, was drafted into the US Navy in 1943, and while Lance scrambled for a new head director, he put Emery Hawkins and Milt Shane on for a single short, 1943's Ration Board. Here, Woody was further softened with white gloves added to his design. Woody would change drastically, however, in the following short, often considered the best ever, 1944's The Barber of Seville, directed by Lance's newest acquisition, James Seamus Culhane. An animation veteran with credits on Snow White and Pinocchio at Disney, Popeye at Fleischer, Looney Tunes at Schlesinger, and on Lance's Dinky Doodle. Colhane applied Russian avant-garde film techniques such as rapid editing, jump cuts and surrealist imagery rarely ever seen in Western cinema at the time or even in French cinema until the new wave 16 years later. Colhane injected pantomime sensibilities, revolutionised the way animation could be frenetically paired with music and with a penchant for action, brought a previously lacking frantic energy, one arguably even more absurdist than the Looney Tunes. With the free Freedom Lance awarded him, in his own words, Colhane was able to go like a son of a bitch, taking the audience on a roller coaster ride, really giving it to them. At the insistence of Art Heinemann, another Disney expert who had moved over to the studio along with Colhane and such others as Dick Lundy and Grim Natwick, Woody was made cuter, more tasteful, and enchanting. His feet were made shorter, he was given a mouthful of teeth and a rounder beak, and his colours were toned down drastically. He became white brown breasted instead of red breasted. His coat, which now covered his legs and tail, was given a darker shade of blue, and his purple eyelids changed to a softer pink. In the words of Moulton, he remained an aggressive lunatic, but a lovable one. With his new look and action-driven aesthetics, Culhane took the Woody cartoons in an exciting and highly praised direction for his entire three-year ten-picture run on the series, continuing to experiment with the use of camera angles and movements and surrealist techniques. According to Barrier, the cartoons for the first time showed that someone was paying attention to all the important elements – timing, drawing, staging, characterization. Woody's hunt for food became even more prevalent in this era, while his violent became even more outrageous and overblown. However, Colhane's madcap woodpecker, easily the character's best ever iteration, was disposed of when Lundy, who had more reserved sensibilities, took over as director, starting with 1946's Bathing Buddies. Lundy was still telling stories the Disney way, and again drew Woody back, making him less hyperactive and violent, more reserved and placid. The shorts still featured violence, though scaled back and justified. Woody was made sympathetic. His actions and madness were given method and motive. Lundy additionally pushed his team to refine their animation and make Woody more expressive. In his words, teaching them some of the Disney ways for better animation in order to put in a little personality. Ex-Disney animator Fred Moore, best known for creating Mickey Mouse's most iconic design in the late 1930s, was put in charge of the soft refinement, first seen in 1947's Woody the Giant Killer. And another ex-Disney animator, Ed Love, was also tasked with adding small Disney-esque touches. 
Archers. During this period, Alliance was facing difficulties with Universal, who were now under new management and rebranded as Universal International. The new executives attempted to recontract Alliance to a deal which would see them gain control of all of his characters' licensing and merchandising. Lance told them to shove it, and after only 28 shorts, took his distribution to United Artists instead. Lance remained with United Artists between 1947 and 1949, basically the entire length of Lundy's run. The quality of Lundy's 14 shorts is fairly debatable. Lundy personally said, The quality did raise up a bit. I think the characters were better liked and more believable because of better animation. Though Lance, who preferred more gag-centric stories, supposedly didn't really like the appropriated Disney touches. Once venting, we got more laughs when I was putting out pictures for $9,000. Now they cost me $15,000 and I'm not getting a laugh. In 1948's Wet Blanket Policy, Lance debuted the Woody Woodpecker song, performed by Gloria Wood and Harry Babbitt, which was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song as the only animated short subject ever nominated in the category. While it lost to Buttons and Bows from Paramount's The Pale Face, starring Jane Russell and Bob Hope, it became one of 1948's biggest singles, cementing Woody as a pop culture icon. Not so coincidentally, right at the time, Andy Panda was being phased out of cartoons, with 1949's Scrappy Birthday his last major appearance. Despite a brief moment of success, after only six shorts, things at United Artists weren't looking great. Amidst the US Supreme Court antitrust case, which pitted all the major studios against the US Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, United Artists were facing major financial difficulties. They were unable to pay Lance his contractually entitled box office percentages, making it impossible for him to produce cartoons and pay back his loan to the Bank of America. As Barrier said, he traded a contract with one weak distributor for a contract with one that was even weaker. Around the same time, Mel Blanc attempted to sue Lance for the continued use of his laugh in cartoons and the Woody Woodpecker song. And while the court ruled in Lance's favour as Blank had never copywritten the laugh, the two reached an out-of-court settlement when Blank threatened to appeal. In late 1948, facing a severe burnout, Lance broke ties with United Artists and closed down his studio. He used his hiatus to recoup costs, which he was able to do by licensing Uni Universal to redistribute old shorts. By early 1950, Lance was ready to reopen. However, fearful of another death knell and having lost no less than six of his most senior team, the likes of Hardaway, Lundy, Love and more, he returned with a skeleton crew of only five cool creatives. Instead of hiring new directors, Lance returned to directorial duties himself and essentially eradicated his story team, putting no writers on staff and eliminating storyboards and exposure sheets. The first project back was a six minute segment for animator and producer George Powell's industrial film Destination Moon. Changes at the studio meant things needed to be simplified and the first to be affected was of course Woody himself. One of Lance's veteran artists, Laverne Harding, developed an incredibly cute, less angular design, rounding out his head and body and making him a touch shorter. His top knot, sharply stuck back since 1940, was pushed forward, becoming a rounded pompadour. Additionally, his entire body was given a thicker incline. In another exaggerated story, Lance later noted that these changes were the result of wanting Woody to look like a leading man. Without Harding to provide the voice, Lance held anonymous taped auditions for a new artist. As legend goes, his wife Grace, an actress desperate to voice Woody, slipped a tape into the pile, and Lance unknowingly just happened to love it and demanded to hire whoever the performer was. Whether this is another embellished tale from the Lances or absolute truth, Grace was hired into the future. Following the segment's success, Lance and Universal patched things up, signing a distribution deal for seven new Woody shorts. Not only was this more than previous years, but they were now to be produced on a stricter budget. This meant more shorts, but less time and less money, disallowing any risk or experimentation. Not that Lance was all that interested anyway. To allow the time he needed to get the ball rolling, Universal redistributed the United Artists shorts until 1950's Puny Express marked Woody's grand return. 
Just as Woody's design had been simplified, overall artistic values of the shorts embraced little risk, and in Moulton's words contained downright poor draftsmanship with a rudimentary animation style. Due to the absence of a writing team, Woody's shorts also lacked much dialogue, though this did have the positive effect of allowing Woody to achieve greater success internationally, especially in Brazil where he remains highly popular. While these shorts lack the graceful, expressive personality of Lundy's or the experimental edge and wackiness of Culhane's, they did feature smart and entertaining gag work. Universal was pleased enough that they contracted Lance for a further six in 1952 and 13 in following years. This allowed expansion into new characters and series, including Chilly Willy, who was mildly popular in the 50s and 60s, and the Berry family in the 60s and 70s. As Lance and his team settled for comfortability and familiarity, Woody saw very few changes for the remainder of his existence, spanning 20 years and 166 new shorts. In 1951's Wicked Wacky, he was given yellow gloves matching his feet, but this change only lasted a small number of shorts. In 1953's Hypnotic Hick, he appeared in 3D in his only stereoscopic film, an attempt to cash in on a recent craze which Lance ultimately found to be a fad. Then in 1955's The Tree Men, his trademark green pupils were changed to large black dots. And in the first short of 1957, Red Riding Hoodlum, he was given thick black eyebrows. Come the mid-50s, the golden age of animation was at death's door, with theatrical shorts falling out of favour and television becoming a more convenient entertainment medium. While Hanna-Barbera began producing shorts exclusively for television in 1957, it was Walt Disney's anthology series beginning in 1954 that caught Lance's attention. Disney used his series as a way to cross-promote his Disneyland theme park and feature films, as well as showcase new serials and repurpose classic shorts and features a brilliant way for him to supplement income. If Walt Disney could host his own series, Lance figured he could too, and saw an opportunity to help fund his shorts. The Woody Woodpecker Show first aired in 1957 on ABC, the same network as Disney's show, and was one of the first series to repurpose classic shorts for TV. Much like Disney's, the series featured several shorts sandwiched between behind-the-scenes segments featuring Lance interacting with Woody. The series was highly successful, revitalising interest in the character and introducing him to a new generation. It ran for an initial two seasons, but continued in reruns, reboots and revivals for the best part of 40 years, keeping Woody in the public eye. Additionally, while Woody had appeared in Lance's new Funnies comic series and starred in numerous issues of Dow's Four Colour Comics from the mid-1940s, seeing his competitors taking advantage of the growing comic market and the popularity of the character, Lance spun Woody off into his own long-running self-titled series in 1952. Thanks to the revenue brought in by the successful series and comics, Lance kept his studio afloat, eventually becoming the last American animator producing theatrical cartoons. Lance managed to outlast Warner Brothers' big screen animation by just a few years, but Woody technically outlived both their and Disney's star characters by an entire decade. Though by the late 1960s, Woody had become so watered down that he was but a shell of who he once was. He had no energy, spunk or unruliness and was now a kind and gentle little bird, slowly made smaller and smaller until he'd reached peak sickening cuteness. His exploits had become plain, boring and unfunny, stripped of all story, relying simply on temperate gag work. This was in equal part due to the disinterest of those at the studio and the rampant censorship regulations of the time. Lance noted so many complaints from Universal that said he was too raucous led to the decline. When he had begun repurposing shorts for TV, he was made to strip them of all risque and offensive material, resulting in a trickle-down effect into the theatricals. While violence was okay for the series, considering TV animation was rife with it at the time, the changing tides in the 60s meant violence in cartoons became heavily regulated and quickly disappeared from all Woody shorts. Through the latter years, Lance continued to expand his star, bringing on more creatives to spearhead the shorts. Artists such as Lovie, Dan Patterson, Paul J. Smith, Jack Hanna, Sid Marcus, 
uh, Davis and Cal Howard all tried their hand at revitalizing the character and breathing fresh energy into him. Sadly, they all failed amidst continual budgetary restraints and a studio environment set by a leader who had simply lost the energy to strive for anything other than mediocrity, if he ever had it in the first place. As the last man standing with full control of the picture, Lance found he could continually slash budget, resulting in a style narratively and artistically indistinguishable from TV's limited animation and shorts commonly considered the worst ever, and Lance would later agree. By 1972, Lance was finding it increasingly harder to continue producing shorts, which were now taking an entire decade to show profit and were making no more than reissued classics. Following that year's slate of eight Woodies, concluding with Bye Bye Blackboard, he finally, in his words, threw in the sponge. He terminated production, farewelled staff and closed the studio. Universal continued to release classic shorts theatrically while Lance focused on putting together packages for TV and continued to license his characters to comic books and merchandising. Despite Lance's past troubles, Woody was irrefutably his standout star and remained in the public conscience for decades after the shorts had ceased production. In 1982, Woody became a staple of Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade through to the late 90s. In 1988, he briefly appeared in Disney's Who Framed Roger Rabbit in a design reflective of Hyman's from the mid-1940s with blue eyes instead of green. And in 1990, he became the fourth fictional character to be graced with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, behind only Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny and Snow White. Lance sold his entire catalogue of films to Universal outright in the mid-1990s 1980s and the Woody Woodpecker show ran well into the 1990s. After his passing in 1994, Universal attained full rights to his cast of characters. They ramped up merchandising, featured him in television commercials and crowned him the mascot for Universal Studios theme parks, where he can still be found as a meet and greet character and in themed attractions. In 1999, Universal featured Woody in a brand new half hour package series, the new Woody Woodpecker show for Fox Kids Saturday a morning lineup, featuring two new Woody shorts and one new Chilly Willy per episode. Woody, now voiced by Billy West, was given another makeover, a somewhat sleeker version of his iconic 1940s design. However, the energy, spark and eraticism of the era's shorts were once again sorely lacking. Considering the 90s spawned such popular boundary-pushing cartoons as Ren and Stimpy, Rocco's Modern Life and Animaniacs, a more traditionally styled Woody Woodpecker series certainly could have succeeded succeeded in the era. However, the new Woody Woodpecker show was far from a hit, described by the Internet Animation Database as poorly written and poorly animated. Ending in 2002, the series lasted only three seasons, consisting of 105 new Woody shorts across 53 episodes, most of which never even aired in the USA. Following the series, Woody largely fell out of favour with audiences in the US, slowly fading from public conscience. He does, however, remain largely popular internationally, where his comics continue to strive and his later cartoons continuously air in syndication. In 2017, Universal released live-action CG hybrid film Woody Woodpecker, targeted towards Brazilian audiences despite being produced in English language. The film featured the first ever CG Woody outside of video games, who took on a 50s design and was voiced by Eric Bowser. Directed by Straight to Home Video sequel director Alex Zam, it was only released theatrically in Brazil, where it grossed $15.3 million on a $10 million budget. In the US and the UK, it went direct to home media and streaming platforms. Lacking any semblance of the classic Woodies, the film was called a low rent revival by cartoon bruiser Mida Midi, and Renee Schoenfeld of Common Sense Media called it an awkward effort with an unoriginal story, ham-handed performances, and reliance on farts and burps. Despite largely negative reception, Zam was hired by Universal to showrun a series of 10 Woody Woodpecker web shorts in an attempt to revive interest in the US. The shorts, released on YouTube in 2018, were produced with cheap flash animation and presented Woody, again voiced by Bowser, in an angular version of that 50s design. The series, just like that of the 90s, saw watered-down stories and tepid humour, aimed at an incredibly young audience, further stripping Woody of his original 
original charm and personality. The series was met by criticism from fans and saw continuously dwindling view counts with each episode. Now in 2020, the 80th anniversary of his birth, Woody Woodpecker seems to be caught in cartoon purgatory. No current productions are planned and he hasn't seen major success in his homeland for five or six decades. It's possible had Lance been the innovator his competitors were, his creations, especially Woody, could have seen a long and fruitful existence. As it is, Woody remains a spectacular character who found himself victim of not only the entertainment climate he endured, but also those who've been gatekeeper of his legacy. I personally hope Woody can find a way to peck back, but maybe it's also time to let the little bird rest, remaining another lost relic of the golden age of animation. And at that, I'm going to throw it over to you. I want to know what is your favourite Woody Woodpecker appearance and where would you like to see the character taken in future? Fire away in the comments below and let me know your thoughts. If this is your first time viewing one of my videos and you'd like to see more like it in the future, then please don't forget to hit that big old subscribe button up on your screen, as well as that like button down below for that little extra support. Also, don't forget to check me out on social media, and please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day.